webinar um, hosted by Social Suite and it's an exciting session this time in conjunction with Sunday uh, around a topic that we get a lot of questions regarding as sustainability teams are running fairly lean is how can we get budget to really drive our sustainability program forward um, and hopefully we're going to give you some good insights um, in how to approach that today so just a little bit of housekeeping you'll notice there is a a chat box on the right hand side we will leave time for q and a's towards the end but feel free to to drop anything uh, in that chat box as we're going along and we can address it as we go as well um so to those that are not familiar with who are social suite who are someday social suite is a software provider focusing around materiality and that process really streamlining that for organizations public private companies uh, also joined by Someday as well, which is another software provider, but focuses around uh, the carbon and the GHG emission space, which, as you know, is, uh, is very important, especially for the upcoming ASRS requirements. Um, if it's your first time again at this webinar, we do host them each month. Um, if you want to revisit some previous sessions that we did around materiality or how to develop your, your roadmap or strategy, uh, feel free to either click that link or jump on our website under the resources section and you can always watch the previous recordings as well. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, the panel today. So we're joined by Dr. Tim Siegenby van Hoekelam, who is the Chief Impact Officer at Social Suite. Um, and kindly all the way from New York Climate Week is Jessica Richmond, who is the CEO at Someday. So Jess, I don't know if you want to add a bit more color in terms of who someday are and, and what you do. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. So yes, uh, in New York at the moment, uh, all the way from Tasmania, where Someday is based. So we really started as an accounting firm that was doing the carbon accounting for clients. Uh, and our background was very much uh, in heavy industries. And we essentially fell into the world uh, of carbon accounting software as requirements were changing and expectations were changing. So now Someday primarily works with accounting firms and sustainability teams who are often uh, handballing some of the carbon accounting and reporting onto finance teams as well. And we really focus on upskilling those teams in the jobs to be done in this space, providing really intuitive accounting software, obviously carbon instead of dollars and cents. And we really focus on supply chain engagement, uh, how to ask for the right uh, GHG information without being overly annoying and with leading uh, through an educational approach on that as well. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jess, for sharing that. And, and I think that educational side will be really important as well, where we see a lot of people are trying to get their head around sustainability, the journey. Um, and today we want to focus on, on one key component there. A lot of companies, as Tom flagged, are asking that question, I know I need to do something. I might have some idea what I need to do, but how do I convince the rest of the team, my financial decision maker, to get budget to do what I need to do? So there's a, there's a little bit of a why we want to go in today, but really keep that brief. Why is it suddenly right now um, time to really start thinking about your budget? There's a good reason for that. So we want to get into that briefly. But the main focus today is really kind of, we're going to unpack and have a chat about, you know, the challenges around budget. What are some of the key components? What are some of the drivers? And what are some, some of the areas to think about finding a way to come up with the right sized fit for your sustainability journey so really think about where are you in that journey what do you need what are your ambitions and then hopefully we can leave you with some key considerations and actions to to take on board and to start preparing your own business case to take to your financial decision maker to get that budget for next year and uh, be in a in a good position so that's the that's the plan for today we'll, we'll run for around 20 25 minutes and as tom said if you have any questions do put them on the chat on the right hand side because we do want to hear from you and see if we can either address them on the spot or at the end of the webinar. So with that, let's look at that why first. And I think this is a, a very important one, in particular in Australia. Um, there is new legislation, sustainability legislation, that is uh, coming into force 1st of January next year. And what we see there is that a lot of companies now seeing that this is becoming real are starting to worry about what do I need to do? It might not hit me on the 1st of January, but maybe the year after or the year after that. And maybe I'm in a value chain with other suppliers, customers, investors that are asking for 
particular information, um, you might already have a good idea of what the Australian Sustainability Reporting Standards entail. You might have no idea. So we thought it is worthwhile to put up this slide and have a little bit of a really brief kind of chat about it, but mostly from a point of view, this is generally why people start thinking about budget, because it's becoming real, it's becoming compliance. It's a, a mandatory requirement now on the climate side. So I think that's a key thing to unpack here as well. We're looking at two standards. We're looking at what they now call AASPS1, which is our general requirements. So think about working out which sustainability matters are material to your business. And once they are, disclose on those particular matters. That's adopted in Australia as a voluntary standard. And then there is the climate related disclosures, AASPS2, and that is a mandatory standard. So that is something you'll have to do if you meet the thresholds there. Now, with that in mind, Jess, um, thinking about this, what do you see happening? Do you see that people are starting to panic? Is everyone well prepared for this or anywhere in between? What are your thoughts with this coming into place now? Um, what's happening? Yeah, I think the main thing that we are seeing, which I hinted towards, was that uh, sustainability teams are often under-resourced for the work that's on their plate. And for many years, they have been doing usually some form of carbon accounting. And I personally don't think that really matters whether it was in a platform or whether it was in Excel, uh, because the main trend across that is that we were doing it in a world where it was voluntary. So if you had someone in sustainability um, doing their best effort to understand the protocol, doing their best effort to get in the electricity and the fuel data and their best estimate on hotspots and um, mapping their emissions. That was really what the organisation uh, expected. And what has happened, particularly in Australia and uh, New Zealand, as of essentially uh, right now, this week, is that we now know that the risk profile of that has changed. And it, it actually... In some ways, I think we're seeing sustainability teams uh, in two camps. Uh, one is feeling really overwhelmed because they're already spending 70% of their time trying to do this kind of reporting that's becoming mandatory. And they're feeling like maybe there has never been this level of oversight on the work they've done. And they're feeling quite nervous about the you know, limited assurance auditors coming in or even just the CFO looking at numbers that no one else has ever looked at in a really long time properly. But we have the other camp that's a little bit excited because they've been trying to handball a bit of this work on to the other departments. And now that this is an accounting standard and the Australian Accounting Standards Board uh, approved the standards uh, last week, now that that's happening, when they are talking about budget next year, they're really starting to say, it's not just what I would like in my small under-resourced sustainability team. If I am now uh, passing some of this reporting work onto the department that is also responsible for the rest of the annual report, we're starting to have conversations around uh, efficiency, uh, auditability, completeness, reducing costs when it does get to audit time. They're the conversations that I now see going on. And I think that's probably a, a good camp to be in. And I totally agree. I think the, the key here is that, what, as you flagged, what this becoming now a mandatory requirement. We really see that change there from a, a nice to have because investors and stakeholders will, would like to see this information and something is better than nothing going toward, we have to have this, it's a need, it needs to be done properly, it needs to be assurable and we need to make sure that we do this the right way. So suddenly that opens a whole different discussion and that flows into budgeting as well. We need to do this properly. What tools, what resources, what training do we need to get on top of this? So a really good starting point, I think, for our for our discussion today. 100%. And I think that upskilling piece is, is really key as well, because as you have departments saying, this is brand new, what are we doing? You know, at least a part of that budget discussion is, well, how do we actually build confidence internally that we do know what we want to do next? Exactly. So with that, if we're going to look at you know what what resources do we need so what is that right size fit the problem of course is there's no one size fits all approach for for every organization in terms of budgeting or sustainability at large you really need to think about a whole number of things in terms of resourcing there and i think you already flagged just quite a few areas there where you know there are organizations that have teams in place if you think about headcount or organizations that have never touched this area and they're really starting to worry now, do I need to hire 
one person, a team? Do I need to look at consultants rather than headcount? Do I just get a platform, technology that will do it all? Is it a mix of that? And I think most importantly, what level of training and development do I need to upskill, build that internal capability and capacity there? Um, you know, there's there's a lot of considerations here, but mostly I think a lot of people wonder about that, you know, the headcount. Who do I need in my team? Where do they sit? Do I need a dedicated resource? Like there's all these questions. Do you have any kind of real world insights of how people deal with that, with that, that struggle around resourcing headcounts to at large for sustainability or for climate and carbon in particular? Yeah, so I can speak to kind of what I did as a bit of a strategy when I was the commercial manager inside a mining organization where we were starting to think about sustainability and supply chain. Uh, I tried to plant people <laughs> in the teams that would be my best friends, where I thought it would be a more compelling case uh, for them to get headcount and take on some of this work. So I used to I think getting budget in some organizations is almost like pitching or you know selling your ideas. So my pitch uh, used to be, and I think it's probably stronger now, is to say, I know that if we have a project team on sustainability, I'm going to be heavily, heavily questioned if I say I need um, just pure sustainability reporting manager. And in some ways that can end up starting this whole conversation that can be quite negatively framed to say, well, what are we going to do with this data? Is it all about accounting and reporting? You know, what's the point? It, it can open the kettle of fish, if you will, on a narrative that I don't think is overly positive. What I would, well, what I did would say, well, this particular piece that's becoming mandatory, particularly when I'm thinking about a 2025 budget, rather than saying, oh, we need to start at ground zero and we need to figure out where all this data sits and it's super overwhelming to report on uh, ESG and we need to hire someone into this team. Another option is to say, well, uh, this needs to be auditable, it needs to be robust, and we now have an accounting standard. So my suggestion is that we do have another resource that we might need if the uh, finance and reporting team is already saying we're at capacity, then working with that manager to say, look, there is going to be overlap. I know this is going to be new to your team, but you're going to have access to so much more data than you know, in some ways what we do, particularly on an emissions uh, inputs sense. You guys already know standards and getting someone in here that's excited by this new wave of accounting and is bringing data to the surface for the company that I can use in the sustainability team to build strategy and to make next decisions, that could be a really compelling case, particularly if you're saying that there might be some capacity for that person to help out the, the finance team in more than just reporting after, say, the first 12 months when they've got all the systems and processes set up. So in my experience, and I'm not saying that's right or wrong, and I certainly think a lot of sustainability teams tend to be um, somewhat undervalued in my experience in organizations, but thinking about where the headcount uh, should sit and how you can essentially benefit from them being in those integrated departments, it's, it's potentially something to think about. And, and I really like that. So to me, that is really a good example of running in your organization, um, sustainability is an embedded function. So sustainability is not a, a project team. So it's not the two desks in the corner there with a head of sustainability and an ESG reporting person and everything get dumped on their desk and it's their problem now. And that's mm -hmm. where the discussion ends. It's about, well, like with finance, if you think about it, every department's got a budget, got a cost center, got, a, got budget lines, they need to be across that. They need to check that. They are responsible to talk to finance, to the CFO about how they run their budget. So think mm -hmm. about carbon in the same way. Think about sustainability at large in a similar way. It is cross-functional. It is across the business. And I think that's the key there. If you embed the right resources or if you train and use that training and development, use budget there to get critical people across different departments skilled up and trained into, in particular, about carbon. What do they need to do? But work out what else is material in your business from a sustainability point of view and get the right people onto that. You might still need someone in that sustainability function to operate a bit of as a, an orchestrator to make sure that everyone is, you know, all the data comes together, everyone knows what they're doing, but you don't need a massive sustainability team 
and run it as a siloed operation because you're not really getting there in the end often. Um, in terms of technology, what role does that play? So we spoke a little bit about headcount, training and development, I think is a real key there. And maybe that links also into technology, but where's that role for technology? Because what we see is that a lot of people do complain about the spreadsheets. Um, mm -hmm. Sustainability is still heavily kind of driven, I think, by spreadsheets in terms of whether it be carbon accounting or anything else in that matter. People build spreadsheets or get consultants to build it for them. And they might have a massive one or hundreds of them. Um, and they lose track and sight and struggle with it. Um, what's the role of technology going forward? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. I think particularly in the you know, GHG space, um, uh, I think traditionally, or still now actually, a lot of the time when we think about uh, implementing technology, I think everyone's first uh, a shortcut in their mind is we need a dashboard and we need a magic API that pulls in all of the data that we might need to report in into a dashboard. And if you have that conversation with anyone that's in IT or even management accounting or finance, in most organizations, and this was certainly my experience in mining, um, that is uh, definitely something that everyone uh, wants, but in some ways that can be a little bit red flaggy for the organization because we've tried a thousand times to make this like a perfect integration. There are, tend to be steps involved um, in really working out exactly what we need and how we want that to flow. And often it can be a bit of a wild goose chase if it's up to the sustainability team to just kind of try and orchestrate all of that. Whereas a lot of the time there are existing systems that host some data and it's about how do we unearth that for, for better decisions. So when I think about asking for budget uh, on technology, the first thing that I'm often uh, saying, and we spend a very long time in spreadsheets, so this isn't really coming from a point of view that they're the worst thing in the world, that you can get a long way. But as this starts to become compliance, one of the things that I would be saying to management is if you want us to do this um, in spreadsheets, you want all inputs to come into spreadsheets, you want all emission factors, uh, which is the input that gives us the average amount of carbon associated with spend, kilowatt hours, uh, gallons, liters, anything that we're uh, inputting into this business. If you want us to do all of that in spreadsheets, then there is a, a flip side of that, that if you get third party assurance on any of this, or if you start um, putting those numbers up to the board or the committee, and they start saying, well, where is the granular breakdown on this? Or where did that source data come from? And at what point in time? Did you apply CPI? Was there an FX methodology in this? It's not just do it in spreadsheets and get it done now. It's the spotlight is coming on that. And do the spreadsheets and the human error that can be involved in that process. Does that add cost when it comes to review, when it comes to actually breaking this down and responding to those new questions? So the kind of pitch again of I can save costs when it comes to third parties reviewing this or when it comes to generating reports that different stakeholders need, getting out of spreadsheets is not just making me as the ESG manager's life easy. It actually has these other efficiencies uh, that we can gain. And the education piece, as you mentioned, is really important. So many organizations no longer want to feel like everything is outsourced to a consultant and that we don't really know what is going on internally. So rather than just pitching, let's get a technology system, no one really believes um, most of the time that the, the technology solution will solve everything. It's like bad data in, bad data out. We've all heard the uh, more crude analogy of that. It's about asking for resources to upskill the team and the jobs to be done in those platforms so that there is actually robustness around the data that we're now dealing with in a more automated dashboard way. I think there's some key points in there, and I would definitely echo that. What we do see, there's a strong move away from that third party consultant approach where we'll just get a third party to do their, their magic we'll get a spreadsheet back with a pie chart and there we go. And there's a, a total lack of understanding of what it actually means you're getting back, yeah. how it's been done. Um, you might get some methodology with it, but there's no capacity or capability 
building around that at all. So every year you're reliant on something, a bit of a black box exercise that sits at arm's length. Um, if you get questions, you don't know how to answer them. So you bring your consultant back in. And a lot of people do want to move towards understanding the streams, in this case, streams of carbon um, that are associated with the business, monitoring them, but also from a more strategic point of view, those big kind of objectives and targets, net zero, you really want to own that. You can't just measure once a year third party. You need to actually be on top of that. The same as you don't once a year look at your financial streams, your financial account, and you're monitoring that very closely and checking that. So I think with a lot of these things, technology has a real place there. And it is that, that approach of can we replace spreadsheets with something that's dedicated for a job that we can train our people on and really own that piece of work. So there's a lot more we can, we can talk about this slide, but I do want to move on from here and talk a little bit about who is the actual financial decision maker, because we get a lot of questions and we see a lot of companies struggle with this, where um, in, in when we talk to people about materiality software and assessments and how to do that, we talk often to that the chief sustainability officer or a similar position there. And even up to today, but, but you know, definitely in the last few years we've always had that struggle well i'm looking for the solution but i still have to go back to my cfo or some other decision maker who owns the budget and they will tell me whether i can or can't do this or do that or get funding for something so this is from research that just came out a few weeks back from ibm so this is pretty recent and they do see a change in that so if we look at those, those four buckets here, strategy, targets, budgeting, performance, reporting, we see that the performance of reporting, you had that, that chief sustainability officer already as the key decision maker. But we see now in strategy, targets, but also in budgeting that to, the, to a degree, um, not every company will follow this, but out of the research, the majority of companies, we see there's more of that decision-making power moving towards that chief sustainability officer or that function there. But there's still, of course, a lot of interaction with that whole C-suite team, with your, your leadership there around, you know, where are, gone, we, are we going to put the budget? Um, so I think this is one of the key struggles we see, particularly in Australia, I think, still as well, where a lot of companies say, we do need something, we feel that sense of urgency, but how do we make that business case around what we really need? And how do we convince the CFO that sustainability is actually non-financial non -financial information that is really important and that should be treated that way as well. Have you seen any shifts in this approach here? Did you see there's, you know, that sustainability function is more empowered to make their own decisions and to own their own budget? Or is that still something that this research might be kind of more Europe, US based? Um, what are your experiences around this? Yeah, I think we do see a bit of a variety, but I do still think that we haven't seen the real shift play out yet because we haven't seen uh, 2025 full budget planning in some instances responding to a compliance world. So I think we have still seen this idea that a sustainability team has been saying it's annoying being in spreadsheets, there are all of these problems, but um, it, it may not have... An, this is different for very large organizations, but say for that mid-market, may not have all of this understanding of the broader business as to what you're even doing in the spreadsheet. So why would there be this big compelling argument to move you out of the spreadsheet and pay for uh, software or consultants or training when we don't even really understand uh, exactly what uh, decision-making is pending you doing this work in the spreadsheets in the first place. So one thing that I do see changing and only in the last couple of weeks have I started to see this come through where even where we have companies that might start to use something and go through that sort of, I guess, pick up that digital solution, so to speak. Last year, that was always someone in sustainability that's really like wrapping their head around this space. In the last two weeks and the last uh, uh, person that was introduced for our onboarding only uh, three days ago, it's the first time that I've seen the senior management accountant as the key contact 
for implementing the platform and setting up the business as usual accounting and reporting. And internally at some day I was like, oh, this is exciting. A, a management accountant is into the world. And I think that's an immediate response to what we're seeing with standards. So what I expect is that it will probably still be sustainability teams driving what do we need here. But I think the buy-in of what platforms we need, as soon as you're tapping on finance shoulder to say, part of this is going to be your job, you might find you get more allies into what tools you need to be able to, to do this going yeah. forward. Yeah, no, spot on. I think that that's definitely one of those reasons, again, that once something becomes mandated, there's a lot of change there. And you suddenly see that whole finance function kind of perk up and say, well, we've got a role in this now as well. And there is a benefit that we do this potentially more efficiently or streamline mm -hmm. the work we're doing with, uh, with dedicated solutions. Now, another one that's quite interesting is that I think to that point is what you made, if you can't build the business case, why to get out of spreadsheets, then that is really hard. If no one fully understands what you're doing, so building that business case is really important. And this is another piece of research that's quite interesting where we see between, between you know, 22 and 23 that change there, in particular around the business case for sustainability is clear. Now, it's still at 63% in terms of executives who agreed with that, but it's a massive one up from that 21. So I think what it shows is that that sustainability function is getting better at explaining, at educating, at raising awareness around the key executives, why sustainability is such an important matter in particular. You now we see the world is really kind of first and foremost looking at climate. What do we need to do there? That's where the, the legislation is focusing first, but there's a lot of other sustainability work there that's equally important that we need to get on with. But if that business case can't be made and that sustainability officer still sits at their desk in the corner, no one really knows what they're doing. But if we have something sustainability, we'll drop it on their desk and somehow it gets done, hopefully. Um, once that equation goes to, well, at the, at the board and at the executive level, we understand this now. We see that there's long-term value in doing this, there's a change. And I think there's a good example here that, that came along with this piece of research where IKEA said, well, we, we kind of get it that we need to get on with this. We really need to get smarter about how we use energy, materials across the whole value chain. There's a lot of things that we as a business now understand that we need to get on with, not as a compliance add-on, but as a long-term business proposition of how we do business and how we create value in our business, sustainability is one of the, the fundamental pieces of that, that puzzle there. So this is, a, this is quite an interesting kind of you know, component as well. But with that, um, what we see, and this is another one, is where um, and the journey, what we see is generally kind of at large, like three focus areas. And we see a lot of people starting now, particularly with, with legislation coming in, thinking around, I just need to get, get on with reporting. So they kind of come in on the right hand side of this slide. They're really coming in with that reporting, that compliance head on. I need to do something. It's all about my performance. What do I need to measure, collect, comply with, disclose and assure? That's what I want to do. That's what I have to do, basically. But there's another piece of work, and I think this goes back to that first slide when we looked at the Australian sustainability reporting standards, is there's also that voluntary component, which in some jurisdictions actually is being implemented as a mandatory part in Australia, but then not yet there. But it really helps you to look a bit, take that step back and say, so what are our priorities really? What do we need to do? And it's very likely that climate will be one of your priorities, will be material, but it really helps you to think about strategically about, you know, what is our, our key focus? What do we need to do over the next few years? What are the areas we need to focus on? How do we do that on a day-to-day -day basis? So that's that operational element. What are the, the systems that we need to implement? What's the doing part of it? How do we embed it across the business? Uh, what are the policy programs, initiatives, and who's going to do this work? And really only kind of at the end of that, then you say, well, now that we have a plan and we have targets and we're doing the work, let's talk about performance. Let's report on that. And I think too, with carbon in mind as well, a lot of people get in there at the first and say, well, let's get a baseline, know where we are. But they quite quickly, they re realize over time, I do want to set targets. I do want to hit that net zero at some point. I do want to demonstrate um, my emissions are getting lower. They're working their way back from there, from a reporting scope 
to what do I need to do on a day-to-day -day basis? What targets do I need to set? So there's, I think, always three, three buckets and components to keep in mind to think about what do you really want to do? Um, and just maybe with that, and I think this is where you started a little bit as well, where you, um, you started with that embedded sustainability, which I really liked, which is in my mind, that full systems approach. When you really start to think about how can we do this in probably the best way, but a lot of people are getting started on the left-hand side more with that compliance. What do I need to do? And that's, I think, in thinking of that business case where a lot of people start is what, what's the minimum I need to do in terms of selling it, in terms of securing the budget? This is something we'll have to do. Then there is that, well, I might increase that business case if I can talk about increased business value. So what are some of the opportunities? There might be a case about responsible business in terms of we really want to understand the impacts we're having at large on the world. So the ethics value point of view, how do we engage with stakeholders? How do we understand the supplier relations? And all these boxes are not that black and white. They're often kind of, you know, a gray area that merge into each other. And then how we do, do we things more efficiently, that operational efficiency. So from thinking about where you are in a journey, these things are really important to think about those three buckets, your strategy, your day-to-day -day actions, your reporting, but also where are you in that journey to think about what is right sized for you right now to start crafting that, um, that budget plan. What are your thoughts, Jess, on, on where companies are at large and how can they best approach that, you know, compliance only versus being more proactive and saying, well, we know there's more coming. So might, we might as well, you know, do it in a more holistic way. Yeah. So I will share uh, what my experience was with this. So to try and get really practical, I think the business case piece is so important. So when I was at the mining organization, I was heading up the commercial department and there was no compliance around emissions reporting. Uh, but it was quite clear to me that there was an opportunity to change out our natural gas as an energy process for the product that we manufactured and we would ship it to steel mills in China. And I started reading about the uh, policy position over there and how they might be introducing some of these changes. And when I first went to the board and had this as a value adding project, I spoke in paragraphs, not numbers. And I think that's probably the number one mistake I see sustainability teams making. And so they said to me, oh, what a good idea. That It's so great to be more sustainable. We'll think about that. And you know when you're taking the room through the PowerPoint slide and no one's really deeply engaging, that's the screaming into the void that so many sustainability people face. So what I did instead was say, well, I don't have all of the perfect data to know exactly what's going to move the needle. But this is quite clear just on logic that there is a business value proposition in exploring this, even if the numbers don't stack up now. So again, I went and hijacked someone from the management accounting team who now happens to be Lindsay, who is a, a co-founder at Someday. And I said, they, nobody's listening to me because I'm, I don't have the numbers around this. Um, how would I convince these, this team of senior managers that we should have $3 million dollars allocated to my department to go and do a pilot with the engineers and the consultants and think about whether this would have a return on investment. And he said, what did you present to them? And I showed him my slides and he just rolled his eyes. He's like, you have no idea what language um, these people want this in. I was like, yes, well, that is why I'm here. And very quickly, my paragraphs were turned into a scenario analysis that they would do every day of the week for making financial decisions, where suddenly my idea of a project became about a risk uh, assessment on whether there was a chance we couldn't ship our pellets into the Chinese market from 2026 onwards. And based on their forecast of revenue from the sale of product in those years, which they have to have for all their insurance and other reasons, what would the potential financial impact be on the organization? What would the shareholder position be on that? How long would it take to mitigate that risk or introduce new technology? It was a five-year lead time to change something out like a plant. All of a sudden, 
there was a business case to get $3 million to go and investigate this. But there is no way that my ideas would have alone secured that budget. And that is where I really learned that as a process. So now in this era, what I would say to someone thinking about budget for sustainability is you have compliance. So you must get a budget for a uh, a headcount, if it doesn't already exist, that can do the carbon accounting and the materiality and actually assess this. Like that's a given and it's a very easy sell. It's compliance. Take the risk otherwise. Probably no one's going to push back too much on that now. Then I would say identify one to three projects that you know on logic have a potential business valuation. Go and find somebody whose language this is to help you build an actual business case and wrap some numbers around that present that as a process and get buy-in from there. That mine didn't care. And now they're working on a full decarbonisation strategy for their fleet three years later. So I would just say speak the language and pick the projects that add business value alongside compliance, which is a given. Spot on. Um, I love that. Like speak the language. That That's such a key thing there that there's still that big disconnect between the sustainability speak and, you know, the people you actually have to convince that it's important. So put it in their kind of terms, scenario analysis, return on investment, et cetera, risk management, um, and get, get the key people and functions already in the business involved. So we see that there's, there's a, a key component there about looking at climate related risk. Now, you probably already have an enterprise risk management system in place, a risk manager, get them involved in this, talk to them. What do we already have and know? And what else do I have to add to that? And how can we bring this together to demonstrate there's an actual case there and to demonstrate like, how are you managing risk? You're in this beast of a spreadsheet. Like, can we together come up with a solution that kind of manage, you know, sustainability risks and other, you know, business risks, bring that together into a solution that works better. So I think it is really speaking a language and tapping the resources in the business already to make sure that we move sustainability really away from that siloed approach to that more embedded sustainability. In the end, it's it's everyone's job. Like ideally you have one sustainability person who's engaged with everyone across the business and make sure that everyone gets it um, and, and does the work correctly so that in the end, it's all about creating business value in the long run. So with that, um, we're nearing the end. So maybe a quick recap there. So we spoke about a lot of these things. Uh, we spoke about that sustainability journey, trying to understand where you are from compliance or all the way to embedded sustainability. What do you need for that? What your legal obligations are? Get that really clear. So that really helps to understand the jurisdictions you operate in here in Australia, ASRS, if you have subsidiaries that are in the European Union, look at that as well, There's legislation there. And elsewhere, we see more and more jurisdictions putting different kinds of sustainability legislation in place. We did a webinar on that recently, so maybe look that up if you're not sure. Also think about what is your ambition and then make sure, again, that you speak the right language when you think and talk about that ambition there. It's quite easy to talk sustainability speak, but if no one gets that, then they might not and just walk away and like, great, you feel that you got there, but no one's really on board. Um, Get views from your stakeholders as well. So stakeholders can be a lot of people. Um, first thing often people think about is investors and they are really important. Like what are they expecting that you do? So you might not be hit directly or at all by the ASRS legislation, but if your investors or other stakeholders like customers, suppliers are sitting there and they need your carbon footprint for their reporting purposes, you better be prepared and ready. So I think that. A lot of companies that are a bit later in, in the game with ASRS or not touched by the thresholds still will have to act. They'll still have to do something. Work out what's material as well. You don't want to do everything under the sun. So it's really important, like financial materiality, really work out in that sustainability realm. What are the key areas that are material from a strategic point of view? What are your focus areas to implement operational excellence? And what do you need to report on? And you know, the most important thing, if you haven't started carbon accounting yet, well, start yesterday. This is something that is now really getting, you know, important for a lot of people. It matters to pretty much every stakeholder. And there's a mandatory requirement around that as well. So quite a lot to, to take away. Um, before I ask Tom to come back and see if there's any questions, Jess, any final thoughts? Is there anything else that you've 
I'd already picked up at, at Climate Week in New York or any other insights or thoughts that people can take away to, uh, to really kind of, you know, practically start thinking about securing that budget. Yeah, I think what I've sort of heard um, and uh, being the accounting nerds that we are, we had six hours uh, of deep accounting sessions with the GHG protocol today at the NYU School of Law. And that discussion uh, at that sort of policy level was really around saying uh, many organizations think there's no standard for this stuff and that we're waiting for all of this. Um, but in fact, there is one. Uh, and there is now an approach to determining uh, materiality. There's a, an approach that the whole world follows, whether you're Walmart, Rio Tinto, or you're the local baker. If you want to do carbon accounting, there is a standard to follow in that. And really the emphasis in these sessions today was an acknowledgement that this is becoming um, compliance. And so more and more companies are wanting this information. And so how do you democratize this? How do you make sure that people are actually getting upskilled, that they're able to come along on this, that they've got access to technology that doesn't cost an absolute fortune to uh, participate in what we're seeing becoming business as usual. And I think one of the main trends we're starting to see, certainly with our customers, is there's such a desire for those suppliers to provide reliable emissions data to the point where we have public organisations in Australia paying for those suppliers to actually upskill and become educated. And Canva had a really great session yesterday here in New York saying they're actually engaging their suppliers through the print stream and paying for some of their renewable energy in return for them providing uh, appropriate data, because that is how important this is. So even if you're sitting there going compliance doesn't um, apply to us, be very surprised over the next 18 months if you're not strongly encouraged to do this. Great, great takeaway. Um, with that, um, you know, always good to just flag again that legislation that is coming in. I see there's a few questions we'll get to, to about that in a moment. Um, if you do want to look at technology driven support there, someday can help you with that, that carbon footprint. We can help you with materiality assessment to work out what's important and what's really kind of relevant for you to report on. So do talk to us if you're interested in that. Um, Tom, I want to hand over to you then um, any questions that have come up in over the course of the webinar yeah thanks tim thanks jeff some uh, really good insights and i think uh, your real life uh, experience in the mining organization i think really help or hopefully helps a lot of people position this case to the relevant stakeholders in their organization so there is a couple of questions i just welcome anyone else if you've got any questions uh, now's the time to to drop them into the chat. Uh, the first one we got from Lou. Hi, Jessica, we are in New Zealand. Do you know if a uh, similar compliance to the ASB will be coming our way? Yeah, uh, New Zealand's actually kind of been ahead of the world, but um, ahead of us. So New Zealand uh, do have these standards and it was applying to the largest companies, similar to what Australia does um, next year, over $500 million in um, turnover largely and scaling down. So New Zealand does uh, have this for those organisations and we're starting to see the feedback come through from those first round of reporting to just say, what do people struggle with? Um, what was still a little unclear? What made this an expensive exercise? what made this a bit of an issue so we see that your equivalent to ours is now working through that at the moment and I think maybe last week they said that they were going to do um, consultation on that more deeply and review what they had introduced to make sure that it is fit for purpose so yes that's that's absolutely underway in New Zealand perfect thanks Jess um I don't think it's a question more of a, a stem from Ming but it says hi Jessica we're in Sydney after spending over a year in the sustainability field, we've observed that despite the widespread conversation in the Australian market, only a few individuals and companies have truly implemented sustainable practices or fully understood their impact. Again, not a question, but I don't know if you've got any uh, anything to add to that statement. <laughs> I, I agree um, fully. When it comes to GHG emissions, um, not to oversimplify, but there are some low hanging fruits. So the, the you've got scope one, two, three. So scope one, we're accounting for emissions that are essentially coming from uh, the, the fuel that we consume largely. Uh, and so you have this business case to use uh, electric vehicles or fleet. Um, at the mine, we were trying to replace uh, 22 dump trucks with an electric uh, fleet. So the, the business case there is 
pretty easy and obvious. You should be underway if you're a large company and understanding that, and most are. Uh, scope two is how much electricity do we consume and is it renewable energy? Again, from a business case perspective, not rocket science. If no one in the organization is looking at that, that would be bizarre. Um, and there are financial reasons to look at that. So and to reduce electricity. So it's barely a sustainability business case. It's a financial business case, obvious. But what is actually the case uh, globally is that over 90% of your footprint, no matter what it is that you're doing, whether you're the cafe or your Rio Tinto, uh, it's everything you buy to run your business. So if I'm the cafe, it's the beans or the milk and everything going into what I sell. There are emissions associated with that. And we see even small businesses saying, I would, I run a restaurant. I'd love to purchase from the most sustainable wine provider, but how, how do I know which one it is? Uh, it's the same at that really large scale. I, I'm procuring raw materials. Who's the best wheat provider when it comes to offering a low emissions option? Nobody knows because nobody has been doing the accounting properly. And a lot of the large organizations have said, oh, I don't want to ask. I've got, you know, don't want to um, upset anyone. I'm still working on my house, which is which is respectful and very much um, understanding of a just transition. But it does mean that 90% of that pool, not much has really happened to date despite all the net zero targets because we haven't really been rigorous and even asking in the first place. So I agree, Ming, uh, but what I think has been really reassuring is that in the last probably three months, I've never seen so much progress on that issue as the last probably three years. Thanks, Jess. Uh, another question for you again, Jess, a very popular guest from <laughs> Sophia. So um, how should we report GHG emissions in Australia? They're an Australian company, um, but they operate in different countries. Which protocol should we follow? Thank you. Yeah, so by some miracle, it seems the world has been quite coordinated on carbon accounting standards, unlike uh, tax legislation and financial standards, to the point where here in Australia, we've adopted the IWSB, the International Sustainability Standards Board's uh, standards to say this is how you do financial related um, disclosures, which obviously Social Suite do a lot more than us in that broader piece. But when you get to the schedule, if you will, on carbon accounting, it says that you must do that in line with the GHG protocol. So I would recommend any company that is starting carbon accounting in Australia that you do it to the GHG protocol. We have a course on that. You can just Google the GHG protocol, um, flick through it, give it to your finance team. There will probably be a penny drop moment that this is very much like normal accounting. But the good news is that even where uh, similar standards have been introduced in the UK, uh, the EU, Singapore, Brazil, Brazil, New Zealand, um, when you look into that schedule on the GHG accounting side, they're all saying make sure it's underpinned by the GHG protocol. So nearly all jurisdictions are following that. And then you have a bit of a consolidation piece around how you report by entity and how you roll that up to the group level. But definitely it's the GHG protocol that you would want to be following. Perfect. Thanks, Jess. Uh, just conscious of the time, I think we'll we'll leave it there. We will send out the recording of this webinar to everybody um, that is registered. Again, they'll be on our website if you do want to, um, to jump on there, but feel free to reach out if you have any questions in regards to materiality or if it be GHG um, related, then happy to sort of um, teach you with Jess or feel free to, to connect with us on LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, I'd just like to thank you again, Jess. I know it's uh, we're pushing 11 o'clock in, in New York, so I know it's a late one. I appreciate you uh, jumping on the webinar, but thank you to everyone and hope everyone has a good rest of the day. Wonderful. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you.